Hey guys, in this video we're going to cover subtopic 3.3 on aldehydes and ketones. Our first science understanding is aldehydes and ketones are produced by the oxidation of the corresponding primary and secondary alcohols respectively. We'll need to know how to identify, name systematically and draw structural formulae of aldehydes and ketones containing up to eight carbon atoms in the main chain with side chains limited to a maximum of two carbon atoms as well as one or more aldehyde ketone groups. To start off, if we talk about aldehydes and ketones, we can say they consist of a carbonyl functional group, which is a carbon to oxygen double bond. In terms of where this is positioned, this is what makes aldehydes and ketones different. Aldehydes, we can say, have a terminal carbonyl group, whereas ketones have a carbonyl group existing somewhere within the hydrocarbon chain. Carbonyl groups themselves are polar, so what this means in terms of its interactions is that it can form dipole-dipole interactions with each other, but it can form hydrogen bonding with water, so we might need to use this to explain its physical properties. Let's now look at the structure of aldehydes and ketones by considering their general formulas. So if, starting off with an aldehyde, we can see that we have this ter terminal carbonyl group here, so it's existing on the end of the molecule. So we've got a carbon to oxygen double bond. It also has a carbon to hydrogen bond. So we can condense it down into this form here. I've just underlined this first part of the word aldehyde because this is the suffix that we use to end the name of aldehydes. Ketones, on the other hand, we can see that they still had this carbonyl group, but it now exists somewhere within the chain. So you'd expect there to be carbons to the left and to the right. And again, we've got O-N-E or O-N underlined. So this is what we often use as a suffix to name for ketones. We're now going to consider some examples where we can systematically name aldehydes as well as ketones and then also look at how we can draw them. So for example, one part A, what we can see here is a carbonyl group at a terminal carbon. So this would make it an aldehyde that would mean its suffix will end in al. What we need to do is look at how many carbon atoms make up the longest chain, and we can see that there are five carbon atoms in there, which includes this carbonyl group here. So an organic compound with five carbon atoms in its longest chain will be termed a pentan, and because it's an aldehyde, we would just call it pentanal. You may remember that with alcohols, we normally have to denote where this uh, functional group is positioned, but because aldehydes have a terminal carbonyl group, it by default has to be on the first carbon and or the last one. Our next example here, we've got this particular molecule. Again, it's an aldehyde, so the first thing we need to do is look at establishing the longest chain of carbon atoms. Keep in mind this should include the carbonyl group as well. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms in its longest chain. We can also identify that there is a side group or an alkyl group. So this one here, which is called a methyl group. And if we were to number the carbons, we want to number them so that the functional group essentially has the smallest number, which in this case is number one. So we start off by indicating any alkyl groups. We have a methyl group on carbon 2, and then we have a, um, an organic compound with six carbon atoms, making it a hexanal. So the full name will become 2-methylhexanal. Third example, we can see that we do again have an aldehyde. Um, it is positioned on this side now, and first thing we need to do is work out the longest chain of carbon atoms. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We can then identify any alkyl groups. So we've got an ethyl group here and two methyl groups. We can number our carbons from 1 through to 6, making sure that we assign the lowest number to the functional group. Another rule is that if we do have different alkyl groups here or different side groups, that we name them alphabetically. So this is an ethyl group, which is alphabetically before methyl. So we're going to start off with a 4-ethyl, and then there's two methyl groups on carbons 2 and 3. So this will be a 2,3-dimethyl. 
six carbon atoms will make it a hexanal as well. This last example is considering a skeletal structure, but we can pretty much do the same thing. So again, we can see it's an aldehyde. Let's count the number of carbon atoms in the longest chain. We've got one, two, three, four, and we can note that there is another aldehyde functional group here. So we're going to need to factor that in with the naming. If we want to number this, we have to keep in mind that we want any side groups having the lowest possible number. So the side groups that we have is a methyl group on this carbon atom here, this one here. And we could number it from 1, 2, 3, 4 from left to right, or 1, 2, 3, 4 from right to left. But we should number it from right to left so that this methyl group has the lowest possible number. So we have a 2-methyl. It's four carbon atoms in the longest chain, so it's going to be a butan. But to denote that there are two aldehyde functional groups, it will be a diol. So our answer becomes 2 methyl butan diol. For our second example, we're now going to consider how we can draw structural formulae for aldehydes. Um, we're going to have a look at how we can draw condensed as well as skeletal structural formulae. So our first one here is 2,2-dimethylpropanol. So what I'll start off with is my aldehyde functional group. And I'll start this off on the left-hand side. Propanol telling me that there are three carbon atoms in the longest chain, but I have two methyl groups on the second carbon. So I'll have two CH3 groups there. And then I have another carbon that will form the longest chain. Let's now consider the skeletal formula. So this helps us better see its structure in three dimensions. We'll start off with the aldehyde group. And I will just show that hydrogen there, but it's not necessary. Then we have three carbon atoms, so one, two, three. And we have two methyl groups onto that second carbon. You can see that I've just shown that tetrahedral shape around that second carbon atom there. For our second example, we're going to look at how we can draw 3 ethyl heptanol. So let's start off with the condensed structural formula. We'll begin with the aldehyde functional group over to the left. We can see it's a heptanol, so this tells us there are seven carbon atoms in the longest chain, but it does have this ethyl group on the third carbon. So let's draw in the second one. And on this third one, we've got an ethyl group, as we'll show here. And we've got another four carbon atoms in the longest chain, so let's put those in. Let's now consider the skeletal formula, and you'll start to realize that this is actually going to be a lot easier to do. So we have seven carbon atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we do have an ethyl group on the third carbon, so that would be this one here. And to show its structure, we will just try and follow it as such. Part C, we've got a pentan diol, so this is going to have two aldehyde functional groups. Pentan tells us there are five carbon atoms within this molecule. And to save a bit of time, let's just consider the skeletal formula. So I'm going to start off with our aldehyde functional group first. So we've got one carbon atom here, two, three, four, this is the fifth one here and it's going to have another aldehyde functional group. In this slide, we can see an example of an aldehyde. So this is a compound called cinnamaldehyde, which forms a key component in cinnamon. And we can see it does have this aldehyde functional group, as well as some other components in it. Let's now look at systematically naming ketones. So our first example is shown as such. We can see our carbonyl group is shown here. It is a part of a carbon chain which consists of four carbon atoms. So our prefix will be a butan. If we number the carbon atoms, we want to number it so that this ketone functional group has the lowest number. So we're going to number it from left to right. We also can identify that there is a methyl group on carbon three. So this molecule is going to have the name 3-methyl-butan-2-ohm. Another way of writing this is 
3-methyl-2-butanone. So that just places the position of the ketone functional group at the front of the name. One thing that we should also factor in is really for a ketone group to exist, it has to exist within the chain. And that means that this C to O double bond can only exist on that second carbon. So if there's not really any other place where this can actually go, then what it means is that you can leave the number out. So it can just be called 3-methylbutanone. But if you're not sure about this, then it's always safer to put the number in. But just make sure that that ketone group should have the lowest possible number. For part B, we've got this ketone here. So we can identify it right here. In terms of the number of carbon atoms in the longest chain, it won't actually be just from left to right. We can actually see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms in the longest chain. So let's go and number those, and we'll number it in this fashion to give the carbonyl group the lowest possible number. We can also identify any alkyl groups. So we have two methyl groups, one on carbon two and one on carbon four. So this will be a 2,4-dimethyl. And then with six carbon atoms, it's going to be a hexan, and it will be a hexan 3 ohm Keep in mind that this 3 can be positioned either between the hexan and the own or at the start of the name. Finally, we've got this skeletal diagram. We should be able to see that we've got two ketone functional groups or two carbonyl groups somewhere within the chain. We're going to name this a dione. We have in our longest chain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 carbon atoms in the longest chain. So this will be called an octan. We will then need to identify where these uh, carbonyl groups are. And we should be able to see that it is positioned on carbons 3 and 4. So this will be called an octan 3,4-dione or a 3,4-octan-dione. We'll now consider how we can draw the structural formula of ketones. So we have 3 ethyl pentan 2 ohm. Uh, we're just going to start from left to right. So we've got a CH3 to begin with. We've got the ketone on the second carbon, so a C to O double bond. We have an ethyl group on carbon 3, which we can also show as such, being a bit more condensed. And we still have two more carbon atoms in the longest chain. So that completes our structure. Let's look at the skeletal formula. So we've got one carbon, two. This carbon has the uh, C to O double bond. We've got three, four, five. And on this third carbon, we have an ethyl group. So there's the skeletal formula. Second example, heptan 2, 5 dione. So heptan tells us that there are seven carbon atoms in the longest chain, and we have two ketone functional groups on carbon 2 and 5. So we've got CH3, we've got a ketone functional group or a carbonyl functional group here, and then on the fifth one as well. And then let's look at the remaining carbons. So just to confirm, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon atoms in the longest chain. And we've got ketone functional groups on the second and fifth carbon. Let's just look at the skeletal formula to finish off. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon atoms. On the second one, we've got a ketone functional group. And then on the third, fourth, fifth, group, we have also another ketone functional group. On this slide, we've got one example of a ketone. So this is fructose. This is an example of a carbohydrate, which is more so called a simple sugar or a monosaccharide. So we can see it does have these hydroxyl groups and quite a large number of them, but we can see that it does consist of a ketone functional group within there. So this is a natural sugar, which we find most commonly in fruits. We're now going to look at our second science understanding. Aldehydes can be readily oxidized. Ketones cannot. We need to know how to draw the structural formula of the oxidation product of a given aldehyde in either acidic or alkaline conditions. And describe how acidified dichromate solution and Tollens' reagent 
which is a maniacal silver nitrate solution, can be used to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones. To just summarize some of those points, what we can say is that aldehydes can be oxidized whether they're under acidic or alkaline conditions, whereas ketones are unable to undergo oxidation. In terms of aldehydes, this can occur under acidic or alkaline. So under acidic conditions, aldehydes, we say, get oxidized by an oxidizing agent to form a carboxylic acid. Under alkaline conditions, so in the presence of hydroxide ions, aldehydes will become oxidized to what we call carboxylate anions. This can occur in two common ways. The first is using acidified dichromate solution as our reagent. We know that this is going to be in acidic conditions. From our earlier work with alcohols, we know that the observation would be that the solution changes color from an orange to green. So that's the dichromate, which is orange in color, being reduced and then forming green chromium 3 plus ions. So in this process, we would say that our aldehyde is oxidized to a carboxylic acid. This equation just summarizes the process of oxidizing aldehydes to carboxylic acids. Our second scenario, so something we haven't actually dealt with yet, is through the use of Tollens's reagent. So its more uh, chemical name is ammoniacal silver nitrate. This is going to produce an alkaline environment. By reacting aldehydes with Tollens's reagent, our observation is that a silver mirror is formed inside our reaction vessel. So in terms of our aldehyde, as we add Tollens's reagent, it gets converted into a carboxylate anion under alkaline conditions. We say that the aldehyde has been oxidized to the carboxylate anion. This can only happen if Tollens's reagent is then itself reduced. And effectively what happens is that silver ions in Tollens's reagent are reduced to metallic silver. And so this will then coat the inside of our reaction vessel. This image here just shows you a flask which has been coated in silver through Tollens's reagent. Fortunate enough for you guys, we'll get a chance to do this in class. So in the meantime, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time.